Okay, folks, it is time to jump in and get started with 22 Nosler. This is the first of many videos. I'm fighting my urge to cover too much at once. Here in video one, we're gonna keep it simple. We're gonna talk over the cartridge. We're gonna talk about the gear. We're gonna talk about the components I've purchased for reloading and the equipment I've purchased for reloading. We are gonna load up 25 rounds and then we're gonna go out and do an initial 25 round side in and, and initial group testing. And then we're gonna talk about that. So that that's kind of the outline for this video. So 22 Nosler was released uh, SHOT Show this year. It is a hot rod 22 caliber cartridge for the AR-15. They claim about 25% of additional case capacity over you know, two, uh, 223 or 556, whatever. What's a little bit weird on this guy is it does have a, re a rebated case head. You know, the case head is smaller than the body of the case. And that was done to make it compatible with the same bolt that's already in your AR for uh, you know, your, your 223 AR. Which means all that's required is a barrel change and these do use the uh, 6.8 SPC magazines. So barrel magazines and you're ready to rock. So what they promise, what they claim, is that you know we're, we're approaching 22250 ballistics with this round. Yeah, I had to grab my upper there and look really quick. Because, um, yeah, what was the point I was making? Okay, so we're approaching 22250 ballistics, so they say. But it's a weird thing. This is a 1 in 8 twist barrel. Not that many... 22250s with one and eight twist barrels. So this is really suited for heavier bullets than 22250. So whenever you see that claim of, you know, that 22 nozzle is approaching 22250 ballistics, you got to look close. A lot of times they're using heavy of a heavy bullet in the 22 nozzle and comparing it to a lighter bullet in 22250, which I guess is fine or whatever, but I don't think it's what most of us immediately think. So if we don't compare it to 22250, so I went with an 18 inch barrel. That's a comfortable size to me. You know, still pretty handy. I have a suppressor that I like to run a lot. It keeps the size about right. So what I'm hoping for out of 22 Nosler is if this 18 inch barrel will, will perform as well as a 24 inch 223 barrel, then that would be great, right? So I get a smaller package, but ballistics that are, uh, you know, hopefully similar or maybe even superior. I don't know. And that's going to be the comparison we're making mostly on this channel. And that's really the main reason why I bought an 18 inch barrel. I do like the 18 inch barrel. Like I mentioned it, I think I find it to be a handy size, but we just built a nice 223 uh, upper with a white oak armament barrel that we've been shooting here over the last couple weeks and it's shooting amazing. So I'm gonna be directly comparing those two a lot. You know, we take a bullet, work it up as fast as we dare in the 223, take that same bullet, see how fast we can get it going in the 22 nozzle and compare how much the 22 nozzle helped. Because it, it needs to be impressive as far as I'm concerned because you're trying to sell it to me over the most popular cartridge on the planet. Most ranges, you just go, you pick up your free brass right off the ground. Not so much with 22 nozzle. Ammo com compatibility with all your buddies with 223. You know, we all go shoot our ARs. We're all shooting the same ammo. Not so much with 22 nozzle. So it needs to be significantly better. It needs to impress me. I guess mostly varmint hunters are going to be the market. Or like I said, maybe people just trying to get, uh, squeeze a little bit more velocity out of a setup like this. Or varmint hunters looking for, looking to approach 22250 ballistics for uh, shooting the groundhogs or the prairie dogs or the coyotes. So there are a bunch of people that have jumped on board here with 22 Nosler. We've got barrels from Odin Works, which is who I ended up going with. Yeah, Odin Works, those guys. Like I mentioned, White Oak Armament is making a barrel in 22 Nosler, and it was really difficult to pass that up and go with uh, with Odin Works here. But I kind of did it for variety. You know, I already have a White Oak, and I know it's awesome. I want to try Odin. I haven't tried them before. Now, what's weird, though, is that... The, none of the barrels are on the White Oak Armament website right now. I don't know if they've sold out. They're waiting on more or, or what's going on there, but there's none on the website. And I can't remember what the price was. This Odin Works barrel is about 300 bucks. I think the White Oak might've been just a few bucks cheaper. There's also a barrel they're selling over on Midway, the AR Stoner. It, it's also an 18 inch, one and eight twist, and it's 139 bucks. So that's the deal. If you're looking for a deal, the AR Stoner is the way to go. And they've got, they've got complete uppers for 500 bucks. So no shortage of, you know, companies making barrels. Factory ammo is from Nosler. I don't see anybody else selling it yet. And most of it's like a dollar 25 to dollar 50 around, I believe. So at least for the time being, this is, uh, this is gonna be a hand loader's cartridge, I believe. So the upper I've got this guy in used to host my, uh, 
my 6.5 Grindle, my 24 inch 6.5 Grindle. It is a Gibbs side charging upper. Yep, over here on this side, we've got our uh, side charger. It is a non-reciprocating side charging setup. It's done really well in 6.5 Grindle. My 6.5 Grindle could really shoot, and uh, this has been a really nice upper receiver. Midwest Industries Rail Silencer Co. Flash Hider, so we can uh, screw my Silencer Co. Omega on there. I'll have details and links on all this crap in the description as well. The, uh, yeah, the scope base is an odd mount. Yep, there it is, odd mount. This base could handle a drop from the International Space Station. It is super duper beefy to the point of being a little bit ridiculous. The scope is a six to 24 Vortex Viper PST uh, first focal plane scope. And I've got this little thing on here. This goes to a, a little camera I'm testing. Yeah, so that, that's what that is. The Odinworks barrel was very nice. I was very happy with the old Odinworks barrel so far as far as the fit and finish. The install, everything fit nicely. What I found super awesome, I wish everybody did this, but they index the gas block and the barrel. So there's a nice little line that you line up and you can be absolutely certain that your uh, gas block is aligned properly. Love that. The barrel does come with the gas block. They call it a tunable gas block. It took, it took a little bit of searching to wrap my head around exactly what in the world is a tunable gas block because they also sell an adjustable gas block. The tunable gas block seems like they, they include one with every barrel. If you buy one separate, they're around 50 bucks, but it is just a poor man's adjustable gas block. And here's the thing, as we sit right here, I've already fired the first 25 shots we're gonna shoot today. So I'll go ahead and spoil it for you. Adjusting it was not a big deal at all. I thought it was gonna be a pain in the butt, it was not. So like two or three shots in, I already had the gas block sit just right. We were ejecting brass just about perfect. This does have a rifle length gas system. So this should be a smooth shooter, I'm thinking. And you know another thing about this guy, I almost prefer it. So let me I'll, I'll, let me show you the drawing of it. Yeah, there we go. Let's, let's go ahead and, and talk about this guy really quick. Because it's like they took a normal gas block, drilled and tapped a hole, put a screw in it, and then just put another screw right behind it as a lock screw. So to adjust it like that, you know, there's two screws stacked right in front of one another. You pull out the first one and then you adjust with the second one. You just turn it until things work properly and then you put the second screw back on top of it and that's what locks it in place. I kind of prefer this because uh, my 223, I put a Wilson Combat adjustable gas block on it and I've kind of found it, you know, it's it's a, it's a, uh, it's got the little spring and ball and the detents and stuff that it's got the, the ball detent adjustment type. And with that block, I've found that I really need an in-between. I'm stuck on a setting that's a little bit overgassed because the next setting down is just too light. So I liked this, I, I dug this. Give me full control over the screw, very fine adjustment, and then by God, you just slap that second screw on top of it, or bolt on top of it to lock it in place. So 25 rounds in, one range trip in, I'm happy with that gas block, definitely. That's pretty much it about the barrel. It, I mean, it is, it's a pretty heavy barrel. It's a DMR profile barrel. 18 inches, rifle length gas, 416R stainless steel, hand lapped, all that good stuff. One half uh, 28 threading, like normal in uh, in 223 or 556 ARs, and uh, it does have a one MOA guarantee, so it ought to shoot. So like I said, this guy does require 6.8 SPC magazine. I ended up ordering a couple from Midway. I got a 10 rounder and a 15 rounder. I'll spoil this one for you. Both of them ran just fine today. So, so far so good with the AR Stoner 6.8 SPC mags. I've had a little bit of problems with an AR Stoner 6.5 Grendel mag, so I was a little bit, a uh, little bit nervous, but it seems unfounded at this point. I also picked up a, a, a new bolt carrier group for this guy. This is gonna be dedicated to this gun. I went ahead and got an Odinworks bolt carrier group while I got the barrel. No headspace worries, Odinworks bolt, Old, Odinworks barrel. Hopefully. And that is a, uh, yeah, here's the sheet from the, the bolt carrier group. It is a black nitride. I've gone with nickel boron the last couple times and decided to just go with the black nitride this time. My nickel boron bolts are in pretty rough shape, to be honest with you. Shooting suppressed a lot, they get caked with stuff and yeah, whatever. That That's a subject for another video. So is that, yeah, have we covered it? I think we've pretty much covered it here. Oh, the lower, we're gonna use, uh, where'd I put it? The same lower 
that we've used with my 6.5 Grendel. Generic Anderson lower, some kind of grip, I don't remember, I don't know, a Magpul PRS stock, and a CMC three and a half pound trigger. I do, I, right now I've got a standard rifle buffer and spring in this dude. I wanna pick up a uh, flat spring, one of the flat springs for it, because this thing makes the boing boing noise really bad. I've got it greased up and the grease is about gone, so whatever. I need to get a flat spring for this dude, but here for a couple mid, uh, couple videos, we might hear a little bit of uh, crazy spring noise. Yeah, so let's let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about the uh, all the reloading crap I had to buy. So as of right now here in August of 2017, your die choices uh, seem to be RCBS, Hornady, and Redding. I chose purely on price. I went with the RCBS. This is their AR series die set. This is a two die set with a uh, taper crimp seating die. It's just a small base resizing die and a basic bullet seating die. I don't know that small base dies would really be the best choice here, but I don't know. Th these were a good bit cheaper than anything else. The Hornady's weren't much more. The Hornady's were pretty closely priced with these, but uh, I think they were 45-ish dollars is what I paid for these. Lee's not in the game yet. Forster's not in the game yet. So it was RCBS or Hornady or pay a whole lot more for Redding. As you can see back here, I do have, you know, quite a few Redding die sets, but I just haven't been buying them lately. I've just been preferring Forster and, and RCBS, it seems. I'll be interested, you know, once we get some Fireform brass to look at, to look at the dimensions and stuff. If we need to switch from a small base, base die to a standard size die, then we'll do that. But for now, you know, I, I have these AR series dies in 300 Blackout as well. And I had some in 223 at one point. I think I gave them away. I don't remember why. Whatever. They're decent little sets. And we definitely shouldn't have any function issues with a small base die. We might just be working our brass a little harder than we need to. Speaking of brass, there is only one game in town, and it is Nosler. I went ahead and picked up a 250 bag of brass. It, it comes in a, a beef jerky bag. Got a little window here for inspecting your beef jerky or brass. Kind of nifty. Resealable for freshness, Nosler brass. Now. This is uh, not good, to be honest with you. So far, this brass has me a touch worried. Now, yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna pull out a couple of random pieces here. These have got super skanky burrs on the flash hole, like bad. Like a lot of times you can put a flash hole tool in and then turn it backwards and kind of get an idea of, uh, there's one. You just kind of turn it and this is not gonna come across very well. But you can just feel, if you turn one of these backwards, you can just feel for burrs. And these have just got huge ones. You can just feel the blade bouncing over top of it. Then you go try to turn it this way and it just digs in. Super gnarly, super gross burrs in at least 50% of the brass I've looked at so far. So this is all definitely going to get flash hole deburred in the first brass prep. When I first found this, I thought about like, well, maybe I should like cut a couple cases in half so we can inspect that. I could show you really well, but whatever. Just trust me. These have super skanky flash holes. They also have really weird primer pockets. Either that or I just haven't reloaded for a caliber that had this before or something but it's got this goofy ledge inside of the primer pocket and the the primer when you prime it you know it comes up and, and it, it sits flush so you're left with this huge moat around the whole primer it's very weird and it seems like they're just giving up friction on that primer you know and yeah we're, we're going to get to the part where we reload this stuff here in just a minute but I'll spoil it for you. I'll spoil it for you and tell you the primer pockets did not feel particularly tight. The flash holes are super gunky and have to be deburred. And beyond that, at this point here in video one, we'll leave closer inspection later. We've got plenty of this stuff, so I'll try to do some sampling of it and and see what sort of uh, weight variation we're looking at and length variation and that sort of thing. 
But here in the first video, I just wanted to hurry up and shoot 25 rounds, try out our new gun, see if it's going to blow up. Now, they do tell you full length resize or full length size before loading. New premium unprepped brass, full length size before loading. That's fine. I was going to I was going to do that anyway. Before we move on to powders and bullets, let's talk about primers really quick. Here, at least for the, the first little while, I'm planning to use Winchester primers, the Winchester small rifle, WSR primers. All of the nozzle load data for their bullets use Winchester primers. We're gonna shoot a bunch of nozzle bullets first, so we're just gonna be sticking to Winchester WSR, at least here for the first five, 10 videos. We'll get crazy and, and test some other stuff later on, but for the time being, I wanna stick as close to possible to nozzlers load data explore that a little while before we go off on our own now on the bullet side of things i didn't exactly buy every bullet nozzler makes but i came pretty close we're covering the entire nozzler line of bullets from 40 grains up to 77 grains i gotta be completely honest here i don't really like nozzler bullets it seems like every time i try them they're a little bit of a disappointment you know, I think terminal performance is fine, but I just don't get the accuracy that I get out of, say, Sierra. So I kind of wanted to jump in here with both feet because I'm kind of viewing this as an opportunity for Nosler to impress me. We're shooting their cartridge, their bullets, their load data, everything's theirs, their brass, their everything. So, yeah, this is the opportunity to uh, show us what they've got. Let's run through them really quick. The 44 grain, or I'm sorry, the 40 grain ballistic tip varmint, the 50 grain ballistic tip varmint, and this is the lead free version. Yeah, the lead free ballistic tip. That was pretty cool. I haven't tried those yet. 55 grain ballistic tip varmint and the 55 grain varmageddon. So two different options there in 55 grain. The 60 grain partition for when we want to go moose hunting with our 22 nozzler. There's even a moose right there. So that'll be nice to turn it into a moose rifle. Next is the 64 grain bonded performance. This has been a pretty crappy performer for me in 223. So I'm looking forward to seeing if 22 nozzler is able to uh, shoot any better with it. The 69 grain custom competition, standard 69 grain open tip match bullet. The 70 grain RDF. Yeah, look at that guy. Look at those crazy uh, ballistic coefficient numbers. Wow. So this is their super duper long range bullet, I guess, 70 grain. And then the 77 grain custom competition is a 77 grain you know, open tip match style. So I think that represents pretty well, you know, the whole spectrum of available bullets. And we're gonna shoot through most or all of these before we ever shoot anything else. Like, of course, I want to pull out my favorite 69 grain match kings and 77 grain match kings and things like that and see how they shoot. The 55 grain blitz king, the 55 grain bobs bulk bullet. Lots of fun bullets to test, but I just, I want to start with Nosler. I want to give them every opportunity to impress me. So let's look at powder. So I've scoured through the load data that's on the 22 Nosler website, and I have just about everything they use. And I have everything that they use for high velocities, which is really all we care about. Let's be honest. This is the slow side of the 223 powder selections, right? Some of these guys better suited for 308. They show top velocities on most of the heavier bullets with H380. So we got plenty of H380. We're definitely going to see a lot of it. Reloader 15, CFE 223, Winchester 760, which is one I haven't shot a lot here on the channel. Ramshot Tack and BLC2. These are some of our, our highest velocity powders. Now, subject to change at the slightest whim, my plan here is to, you know, we'll have this first video where we go through stuff and we shoot the gun and everything seems just fine. And then the next videos will just be bullet test videos. And we'll just explore, you know, from our huge pile of bullets, we'll pick one bullet, we'll pick two powders, and we'll do kind of like my normal bullet test video, you know? Here's a bullet, here's a couple powders, let's go see how they shoot. So all these guys are definitely gonna show up sooner rather than later. I've got a second row back here, let me see if I can, here we go. 
Winchester 748, Accurate 2520, Hodgton Varget, Hodgton H335, Hodgton H4895. Now we're getting into uh, things that are even more familiar for the 223 shooters. The lighter bullets, these are the powders we're gonna start seeing more of. Once we get through these first few bullet tests, start feeling confident, start characterizing how things are going, then we might pull in some other powders that, uh, that Nosler didn't test, like AR comp. I wonder what a big old fat case of AR comp would do in this thing. We might break 5,000 feet per second. Or maybe like lever evolution. People are having luck in Grendel. I wonder if we stuff a case full of lever evolution, what happens? I don't know. We're gonna get there someday. So is there anything else I need to cover before we move on to today's actual shooting test? We've talked about powder, we've talked about bullets, we've talked about all of our other components. So no, I don't think so. So here's what I've done. For today's video, I just generically picked one of the bullets. And since the 69 grade Match King is my favorite bullet in 223, I picked the closest we've got to it here and that is the 69 grain Custom Competition. And I wanna use H380 powder. So if we go to the load data, if we look at the 69 grain load data, they have the load data for the 69 grain Custom Competition and the 70, and the 70 grain RDF grouped together here. But you can see down there towards the bottom, H380. And I want to shoot the middle charge, so 30.5 grains. I know I should really start with that starting charge of 29.5, but we're sighting the gun in and everything. It would be nice to have something with uh, at least average velocity here. So let's go with 30.5 grains of H380 and the 69 grain custom competition. Overall length of 2.260. Winchester WSR Primer, Nosler Brass. I mean, we're following their load data precisely. So I'll go ahead and send you guys to that, which I filmed earlier. So I'll see you guys after it's all loaded and shot and we're done and we want to look at the target and talk about the results. Tell you what, the first thing I've got to figure out here is which loading trays are going to work. So a 223 reloading tray, like a... Frankfurt Arsenal perfect fit number two, not even close. But I thought that the universal tray is like this. I'll tell you what, I need a piece of 223 brass. There we go. You know how these have the ones that sit up high and fit a 223 really nice. I was hoping that the rebated case head would fit down in there and it doesn't. It doesn't quite fit, so that's out. The deep holes, you know, eh, eh, nope. So this style seems to be out. The MTM, let's see, who the hell made it? Like this is a Hornady. Yeah, this one's Hornady, and you know, there's a couple brands that look exactly like that. That's that's out. And the MTM here, yeah, the small, small holes on the MTM are a decent case fit. That one's not bad, but it's a little bit wobbly. So, yep, I think small holes on the MTM is gonna be the way to go. The number four Frankfurt Arsenal perfect fit for like the 6.5 Grindel is a pretty darn nice fit as well. Definitely not perfect at all. I don't know why I didn't think about any of this crap beforehand and I need ammo boxes. I don't even know what size ammo box is gonna work. Yeah, it looks like for now a Grendel box is a halfway decent fit. Should be able to get a hold of them. The height is correct and the size isn't too bad. So let's see. This is the Frankfurt Arsenal box that fits 7.62 by 39 and 6.8 SPC. I'll have a link down in the description. Or actually, maybe I won't, because I still, I don't know if this is perfect. There may be some really good fitting ones. You know, maybe there's another size that fits these uh, much better. So I'll look into it a little bit more before I go recommending anything. So I don't see on Nosler's little load data sheet, it doesn't specifically call out trim length. It does show maximum case length in the drawing of 1.760. So this should be 1.750, so exact same length is our 223 brass. Let's see what length they gave them to us. 1.748, 1.745, 1.747. 
So these are a little bit short of trim length, 1.748. I don't expect these to uh, stretch much when we resize them, 1.750. So they're all about trim length-ish right now. So I'm gonna measure each one as, we, as I pull it out just to make certain. I'll probably do a deeper dive into this brass eventually and do some weight sorting and just closer inspection of its properties. But for these first 25, I'm going to grab the first 25 out of the package. All right, no weird lengths in these first 25. So the very next step here, I want to go ahead and get rid of that nasty primer pocket burr in these guys that I so just giving these guys a couple twists, tap it out, and that's it. God, some of these burrs are just nasty. <laughs> like they just really, that one's fine, that one's not bad at all. But some of them just hang up really bad. Yeah, there's one, that first, getting that big burr broken loose is a pain in the butt. Good thing about the way this Lyman tool seems to cut, it, it actually doesn't cut all that well. This is one tool I wouldn't want too sharp because it's not something you can visually inspect very well. They, you know, they do have these stops on here where you can, you can adjust it so that it doesn't go too far or cut too deep. But I generally don't even use them because, well, I mean, just like this brass, as we were pulling it out of the bag, there's a plus or minus three or four thousandths variation in the length of them. So I don't want to use a stop that relies on uh, consistent case length when I don't have consistent case length yet. But yeah, it just, it, it does a good job of knocking off the burr. And then if you just keep going until it, you can feel it smoothing up really nicely, it doesn't cut a bunch. Like it's not constantly trying to dig in more and grab more brass. Once it gets rid of that burr, it just kind of sits there. All right, let's go ahead and size these guys. Got our RCBS resizing die that we've already wiped out and it's ready to go. It's got its 73 foot long decapping pin in there and it's ready. Better hit up the instructions Make sure there's not some weird way you have to set this. Nope, nothing weird in there. Screw it down until it touches. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I went ahead and popped the die out again. I've got the, uh, you know, our expander there. I'm gonna go ahead and just wipe a little bit of Reading Imperial Sizing Die Wax on it. Just to grease the operation up a little bit. I always like RCBS expander balls. You know, they're nice and long and tapered. If you've got boogered up necks, they do a really nice job of spreading them out and getting them back into good shape. All right, so here for this first, uh, you know, first trip to the range, we're going to go ahead and resize these as much as the die wants to. Once we get some that are fire formed, we'll have a closer look. Here we are, first case. No problems there. Seems like the brass fits the die. That's, uh, that's a good start. So I got the case lube off of these guys with a rag and a little bit of alcohol. Now I'm deburring, chamfering the case mouth giving them one last tap on the counter to make sure all of the brass shavings are out. All right, let's see how the primers feel in these weirdo primer pockets. I'm in a lazy Lazy mood today, just dump the primers in there. 
all haphazard like. I don't think I spilled any. Yeah, that primer pocket was a little bit loose. Good God, that looks weird. That is just freaking weirdo stuff. All that space around the primer. Maybe this is more common. Maybe I'm just an idiot who hasn't been out much living under a rock. That's weird, man. That's super duper weird. See if our pockets continue to feel. Yeah, that one doesn't feel so bad. So except that first one was the loosest of the bunch, but none of them were particularly tight. I'd, I'd prefer these a little bit tighter, but I'm still just freaking out over that big space all the way around the primer. Maybe all rebated case heads require that for some reason. I don't know. Maybe I should look into that. All right, we need powder now. So we are using 30.5 grains of H380. This is a good metering powder, so I'm just throwing these charges. They'll certainly be close enough for what we need today. All right, here's our bullet seating die, and we definitely want to check the instructions on this guy. This die does have a, a taper crimp, which I don't think we'll use here for the first loading, but we need to know about it so that we make sure that it's not going to cause us any problems. All right, I hate RCBS instructions because they have generic one, fits, one size fits all instructions, and uh, you never know if you're looking at the right section for your die. Seems like most of theirs, they have you go ahead and just run a case up inside of the die and then screw the die down until you feel it touched the case mouth which will be you know the taper crimp touching the case mouth so there it is and then they have you go one turn out from there I guess and then start your adjusting but we're gonna go ahead and just lock it down there call that good enough should work let's hope and go ahead and seat a bullet let me loosen the adjustment stem and back it up a bunch. I think our 69 grain custom competition hollow point bow tail should sit down in here pretty nicely. Good. All right, so it did actually touch the stem a little bit, but we're still very, very long. So I'm going to go ahead and get us a little bit closer to where we need to be. Okay, still should be quite long. Let me double check. Uh, 2.359, so we're exactly 100 thousandths long right now. What I wanna do is go ahead and grab a magazine. Yep, still a good bit too long to fit in the magazine as well. You can see that. There you go. All right, here's one just short of 2.315. And it is finally to the point where it'll go down in there. Getting still a little bit of uh, dragging there on the me plat. So we're close, but I think 2.3 would be a easy, plenty of room. And 2.310 would be pretty darn good as well. Yeah, this is guys going down in the, uh, the little 10 rounder as well. Beautiful. But we'll get into that later. Today, we're going to stick with what they want us to do, which is 2.260. Yeah, so of course, whenever I'm setting my overall length, I, I grabbed the wrong bullet. I grabbed a bullet that trended a little bit long. Yeah, there's another one. So, I mean, we're very close to 2.260, but you know how the hollow point match bullets are. A couple thousandths of gnarly stuff up there isn't abnormal so some of them are all the way down to 2.254 
that one is. That's the that's the worst one so far. Another 2.254. Whatever. We're in the ballpark. So this is really it. I just have to seat these additional 20 bullets and we're ready for the range. And I'm running out of daylight. It is, well, it's about 4 o'clock. Couple hours to play around. No reason to freak out. So I'll see you guys out there. All right, to kick things off, I've got a target at 50 yards. We just want to get the scope somewhere close. I've got our 10 round magazine. I've got five rounds in it. So we'll test this guy out first. One thing I did not do, which was pretty stupid, was actually chamber around back at the bench. All right, so they all seem to chamber just fine. All right, first things first, we've got no suppressor on yet. Let's see if it blows our face off. All right, we're hitting quite a bit high, which makes a lot of sense. I forgot about the 20 MOA rail. My tunable gas block is clearly not open enough because, yep, we did not eject that round. So there we go, next one in the chamber, gun on safe. All right, this first piece of brass got a little bit jacked up. Pulled up a nasty bar where, uh, burr where the ejector was, and it appears to have bent the rim where the extractor was. So I guess we should have started with the starting charge instead. Unless maybe it's related to the gas problems and it's just not, uh, maybe it partially ejected, but yeah, I don't know. So I've opened up the gas block a little bit. Let's go ahead and shoot another one. So I'm gonna go down 16 MOA. I think that's about it, something like that. Yeah, actually, so that one did cycle. So let me run down that piece of brass, we'll see what sort of condition that rim's in. Okay, that one actually is in a bit better shape. Let's go ahead and move our target to 100 yards and keep going. Okay, so our target is at 100 yards now. We've got three rounds left in this magazine. I went ahead and threw my suppressor on there because that's what's uh, got my magneto speed chronograph on it. I wanna get some velocity numbers. Getting these little signs of pressure, but if, uh, if we're not over like 3,000 feet per second, I'm just going to keep trucking. So I just wanted to get a, uh, yeah, I wanted to get a velocity number to know about where we're at. So let's go ahead and shoot at the center dot. We'll go ahead and finish off these three rounds on the center dot, see what sort of velocities we get. Yeah, that was 2,827 feet per second. I don't care what the brass says, it should be able to do this. All right, two more at the center dot. I'm going to go down a minute and a half and right three quarters of a minute. So our bolt locked back. That's good. You know, good start with our, with our magazine. Yeah, this poor brass is kind of in bad shape. We'll look at it close when we get back to the bench, but here's five more rounds. I want to shoot a five shot group with the suppressor and chronograph on here. And then we'll take it off, shoot another five shot group, dialing in our scope settings as we go. All right, I guess that group's not too bad. Our second mag worked just fine, locked the bolt back, fed good. Yeah, so after eight shots, we're averaging 2,860 feet per second. Okay, now five shot group without the suppressor. We'll shoot at the dot right below the last one. Okay, just for fun, one more group without the suppressor. All 
Okay, last five shots. Got the suppressor and chronograph back on. All right, I think we run some brass, but at least we didn't blow our face off. So let's get back to bench and evaluate things. All right, so we're going to struggle to find good things to say. Here are the few groups that we shot. Our best was a 1.16 with the suppressor. Our worst was a 1.74 with the suppressor. The two without the suppressor were in the middle at about an inch and a half. That's not exactly what I had planned for this gun. This fails to meet my expectations. Oh God, what a mess, man. We freaking mangled this brass. I should have stopped. We should have pulled this ammo. At least, I would say, six or eight pieces of the brass have so much damage that they're definitely screwed. Just huge burrs on the, on the rim. Or bent, or like kind of I don't even know what to call it. It's not a bend. It's not a cracked. It's a bend, I guess, maybe. But this bend on the rim by the extractor and then the ejector hole. I'm kind of surprised by how rounded the shoulder is here. I'm very interested to get a, uh, like the Hornady case comparator on this guy and measure it, compare it to uh, one of our sized cases. Yeah, there's a before and after. Yeah, I don't know. We'll look closer at that in the next video. I am completely out of time. It is actually almost 3.30 a.m. So you're supposed to see this video in four and a half hours, which is not going to happen. It takes a couple hours to process and output the final video, and then it takes several hours to upload on my hillbilly internet. So running a little bit behind. Yeah, I just picked the wrong load. I just really picked the wrong load. And after this happened, I did do a little bit of searching. There is very little data out there, very little information out there. But I did find a guy talking about he was shooting a 55 grain. And it was, and he ended up at really bad pressure and blowing primers out inside of Nosler's data. So I need to, I need to get a better attitude about this whole project. So I think what I'm planning for the next one is let's shoot that lower load of H380 and see if it if the pressure's calmed down and maybe pick another powder. We'll just stick with the 69 grain custom competition here for a little bit longer, see if we can uh, figure things out a bit. It's a little bit frustrating and disappointing at this point. No doubt about it. I'm hoping we're not that far away from normal pressure because... A 69 grain uh, bullet, we ought to be able to get something close to these speeds with H380. You would think. I don't know. I need to do some thinking. It's the middle of the night. I'm not thinking straight, perhaps. So this is where we're going to wrap this one up. This isn't going to lay very long. Uh, I'm not sure if tomorrow's video will be 22 nozzler, but if not, it'll definitely be the next day. So within a day or two, we'll have the next video on 22 nozzler. Hopefully we can rein this in a little bit, try some lower charges, establish some at least passable uh, uh, accuracy. Cause this crap ain't going to cut it. Not even close. So that's the plan for the next one. All right, if you would like to support the channel, come check me out at patreon.com slash reloading. See you guys next time.